الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أما بعد حبت في الله continue on in our study of Nawaqid al-Islam a very important issue that we have to get into because it's very related to the topic of Nawaqid al-Islam or the nullifiers of faith is the issue of takfir and we just want to give a brief overview because when we're talking about things that nullify one's Islam that means that takes them out of the fold of Islam so this has a tremendous uh, relationship or it is directly related to takfir and takfir is the belief of it is the uh, 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 as a part of creed and also it has a fiqh uh, a fiqh point and it is to declare someone to be an apostate from the religion takfir means to declare someone to be an apostate from the religion. That's one meaning of takfir. Takfir also means, you could say takfir dhanub, meaning to expiate one's dhanub, one's sins, to uh, get rid of or do things which remove the sins. But the takfir that we're concerned with, which is used as a mustalah or a term uh, in, in aqidah books, in creed, and also in books of fiqh, uh, when talking about those things which negate one's faith, refers to the latter definition, which means to remove someone from the fold of Islam. Takfir is of two types. The first type is called takfir mutlaq, or the general takfir. <clears throat> and the second type is takfir al-mu'ayyin. Takfir al-mu'ayyin refers to the specific takfir. So the first takfir, takfir mutlaq, or the general takfir, this is huwa fi haqiqatihi wasf li qaw aw fi'l aw i'tiqad bi annahu kufr. So takfir mutlaq, or the general takfir, in reality is a description of a uh, a statement or an action or a belief that is disbelief what and, and, and for an example let's look at an example an example Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Kitab al-Kareem inna ladhina kafuru min ahlil kitab wa mushrikeen fi nari jahannama Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says verily those from the mushrikeen and, uh, and Ahl Kitab, the people of the book, meaning the Jews and the Christians, are, are in the hellfire forever that they have disbelieved. That lets us know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made takfir of all of those who fit that description. Who are those who fit that description? The, uh, Ahl Kitab and the mushrikeen inna alladheena kafaru min ahli al-kitab wal mushrikeen so verily those who have disbelieved from the people of the book and the mushrikeen and the the polytheists so polytheists uh, follow under takfir mutlaq that's the general so whoever is a polytheist polytheists or a polytheist is a disbeliever and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made the general takfir of them that's what we mean by takfir mutlaq also in the same ayat, uh, the Jews and the Christians, uh, that uh, the people of Ahl Kitab, after the coming of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his message, Alayhi Salatu Wasallam, and even before the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, many of them, of those nations, had went astray. So there were some who remained on Tawheed, on the belief of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. So those who fit that description of having gone astray from Tawheed, from Ahli Kitab, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also made takfir of them. That's what we mean by takfir mutlaq. So there's no problem with that. So takfir, uh, I think in understanding that, takfir mutlaq 
is a general description, the general takfir of a group or a particular action, meaning whoever does such and such, they are a disbelief, disbeliever. Whoever says such and such has disbelieved. Whoever believes such and such is a disbeliever. So for example, we could also say, whoever supplicates to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has disbelieved. That's a general ruling of takfir on anyone who does that action. That's what, why it's general. It's a general description of people who do this action. That means they have disbelieved, and that's an action. Or for example, someone who says, uh, I worship or uh, Jesus is the Son of God. in that from this uh, belief. Someone who says this, then we say in general, the person who says this, they have fallen into shirk al-akbar, the major shirk which takes them out of the fold of Islam. That's takfir mutlaq. Takfir al-mu'ayyin, the other type of takfir. This is in reference to applying that ruling on a specific individual. So for example, if we say whoever does such and such, whoever supplicates to other than Allah, then they are a disbeliever. So if someone says, in the name of Jesus, I do such and such, billah, then we say that they are a disbeliever because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made takfir of them and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has made takfir. They fit under the general category. When we talk about a specific individual who has done this, then this is uh, called takfir al muayyin meaning the specific takfir which is applied to a specific individual. So then the person who falls into this, now this requires an alim or someone who has knowledge about the issue of takfir and knows uh, 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 you know, about these issues around it and the conditions for takfir and the, uh, the things which prohibit uh, a person from making takfir. A person needs knowledge of these things uh, in order to be able to apply that hukum, that, that ruling. I hope this is clear. Inshallah ta'ala, it will be. So takfir al-ma'ayin, the specific takfir, this requires, this has the wabit, it has criteria. And the first point we want to make is that takfir al-mutlaq la yastalzimu takfir al ma'ayin. This is very important and this will hopefully, and this is one of the reasons why we are talking about this complicated issue. So we need to be patient. Once we get through this issue of takfir, the rest of the book will be at a much easier level and uh, a bit more digestible for everyone, for the different levels that are studying this with us. So, a takfir mutlaq, this general takfir, this general ruling of takfir, does not necessitate takfir al mu'ayyin. Very important to understand this, because this is where a lot of the youth go astray and a lot of the takfiri groups go astray. They said so-and-so did this, so-and-so wore this, so-and-so was making a resemblance of the disbelievers, so-and-so showed love of the disbelievers, so they are a disbeliever. This is how they their mentality operates because they are they are going by perhaps in some cases the general takfir mutlaq and then they are applying it without the right to do so without the conditions being in place without knowing those things would prevent from making takfir on a specific individual they are trying to make those rulings without those other conditions in place so very important to understand that just because someone falls in to major kufr does not always necessitate that they are a disbeliever. Very important, this issue. And we're going to give some details because this sets the pace and the tone for the whole book. Because this book is about nullifiers of, of faith. Ashura Nawakad, the ten nullifiers of faith that were very common in the time of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab rahimahullah ta'ala. 
meaning that there are more than 10. It's not just restricted to 10. But these 10 were very common in his time. And these are things he witnessed in his society and around the world, especially in the Arab, uh, the Arab Peninsula. So, Takfir al muayyan what is evidence for us, or what we have to know, is that the takfir mutla, going back to the general takfir, is that it's a description for a statement or an action or a belief which is disbelief. Or a group or a sect which is known to have beliefs which take them out of the fold of Islam or make them non-Muslim. For example, if we say no one has dispute from the from Ahl Islam. This is Ijma. The the scholars have Ijma. The Quran shows uh, evidence for this. The Prophet ﷺ, the Sunnah shows evidence that Jews are disbelievers and Christians are disbelievers. There, there's no dispute about that. The only people who dispute about that is people who, in fact, have fallen into disbelief if they say no Jews and Christians are our brothers and they are uh, uh, believers. No, we cannot say that because Allah made takfir of them. So then if you deny that, you're, it's as if you're calling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a liar. So very important, that is takfir mutla. They are a group which are known for traits of disbelief and shirk. Likewise, within the general ummah of Islam, in which people people who claim to be Muslim, for example, the Nation of Islam in in, uh, in uh, America, in fact, they have very little to do with Islam because of the shirk. It's because of the shirk of Akbar. They believe Elijah Muhammad came to the or, or wore the. Uh, Fard Muhammad came uh, in the flesh or the person personification of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala billah min dhalika. This is Kufr al-Akbar. So they are not even Muslim. Although they consider themselves Muslim and associate themselves with Islam, they are a sect which fits under, so we can easily say, someone who is a member of the nation of Islam and they, they hold their beliefs of the nation of Islam is not a Muslim. That's Takfir mutlaq. Then when it comes to applying to a particular individual, that's called takfir al muayyan the specific takfir. One of the things uh, which is very important that when a person, when there's going to be made a judgment on a specific individual, meaning takfir al muayyan the specific takfir, that there must we, uh, that the person must have clarified to them that their action is disbelief in a manner which they understand. So meaning just because, for example, and I was just listening to uh, some benefits about this from one of our Mashiach, he was saying that uh, someone may take fear of all of, basically all of Africa. And this person was from an African country. Because they said in our country, the, you know, in our country, and in fact he was talking about the whole continent of Africa, which is how many countries? And he made takfir of all of them. Takfir mutlaq. And this is the minhaj of the Khawarij. So he made this general takfir because he's so much shirkiyat and, and things that, that fall in place. And this is with, with because of what he sees, he sees uh, certain descriptions that people are doing widespread. And he just makes takfir of whole countries. This is not permissible. And when we make takfir, lazim, qama alayya al hujja that you must establish the proof. Meaning the proof, the people have to have evidence presented to them. And we're going to get uh, more into detail about that. And what shows us evidence for this that they, they need to know why, why, how do we know that people need to have this issue clarified for them? And that's because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not punish anyone from his creation 
uh, that has fallen into disbelief or sin until they have had that made clear to them that they uh, that what they were doing was sinful and was disbelief. Meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a Rahim, a Rahman, He's the most beneficent, the most merciful. He doesn't just punish people because of the society they grew up with. But in fact, if they did not have the message delivered to them, then we judge them in this life as disbelievers if they're, you know, uh, doing disbelief and, and what have you. But their judgment will be with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He will test them because he subhanahu wa ta'ala knows whether they would have believed or not. And what is the proof for this? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the Kitab al Karim, and this is about the, the, this is evidence that you must establish the proof before make, making takfir. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا كُنَّ مُعَذِّبِينَ حَتَّ نَبْعَثَ رَسُولًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and we were not uh, punishing the people until we, we did not punish the people until we sent them a messenger. Meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala delivers the truth to the people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the truth and gives clarity to his creation because that's from his justice. He is a he is al-adl. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most just. So he does not punish his creation without establishing the hujjah. And that's why we don't just rush into this issue of takfir. And we're going to talk a lot more about it. And there's many things we need to say. In this verse, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا كُنَّ مُعَذِّبِينَ حَتَّى نَبْعَثَ رُسُولًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and we did not punish them until after we sent a messenger. قَالَ قَتَادَ فِي تَفْسِيرِ هَذِهِ الْآيَةِ هَذِهِ الْآيَةِ in Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala, Laysa Yu'adhib Ahadan Hatta Yasbaku Alayhi Min Allahi Khabar O Yatihi Min Allahi Bayyina Wa Laysa Mu'adhib Ahadan Illa Bidhim Illa Bidhim Bihi Qatada Rahimahullah Ta'ala mentioned in the explanation of this verse that verily Allah the Almighty does not punish anyone until he gives them warning or news about the message that he gives them the message the message of Tawheed the message to stay away from shirk the message to stay away from the noob and ma'asi or that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives bayna, gives clarity so these things, these affairs will be clear they'll be clear, why? because they're sent by a messenger and all the messengers alayhim afdal salatu wa salam came with tawheed, came with Islamic monotheism وَلَيْسَ مُعَذِّبٍ أَحَدٍ إِلَّا بِذَنْبِهِ and no one will be punished except for their sins. So letting us know, subhanahu wa ta'ala, letting us know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not punish his servants until after they've been warned. So this lets us know that this is a condition is that as khulafa or as the khalifa on the earth, meaning successors, that we, mankind, are in charge before making takfir, before making these rulings, that we must deliver the message, that the people must be, uh, before making takfir of them, they must have the hujjah established, and the barhan, and the bayna, the clarity, and the proof, and the evidences presented to them. Ibn Kathir said about this ayat, إِخْبَارْ عَنْ عَدْرِهِ تَعَالَى وَأَنَّهُ لَا يُعَذِبَ أَحَدٍ إِلَّا بَعْدَ قِيَامُ الْحُجَّ عَلَيْهِ بِإِرْسَالِ الرَّسُولِ إِلَيْهِ 
Ibn Kathir said about this same verse that this is this verse is actually khabar you know it's news let it, uh, about the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that he does not punish anyone until after he has uh, given them the evidences given them the proofs and sent to them or given them the proofs by sending them a messenger and many of the Mufassirin and there are many ayat in the Quran which illustrate this important point for us <clears throat> and from the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the hadith in which this is a hadith in uh, Ibn Majah Ruahu Ibn Majah wa Imam Ahmed in which Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiallahu ta'ala an he came from Sham he was sent to Sham and he came from Sham Sham meaning like Syria uh, Jordan Philistine this area and so he came from Sham and he made sujood to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that means he prostrated on his face to the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam responded by saying ma hadhi ya Mu'adh what is this Mu'adh? Uh, and then Mu'adh explained that he had been to Sham, he had been to this region, to this area, and he saw that the people, that this is the way that they uh, were with their righteous people, is that they used to make sujood to them. So he thought that the Prophet, والسلام, even more so was deserving of prostrating before. The Prophet ﷺ said, فَلَا تَفْعَلُوا فَإِنِّي لَوْ كُنْتُ آمَرًا أَحَدًا أَنْ يَسْجَدَ لِغَيْرِ اللَّهِ لِأَمَرْتُ الْمَرْأَ أَنْ تَسْجَدَ لِزَوْجِهَا Al-Hadith So the Prophet ﷺ responded to Mu'adh. He said, don't do this. He said, for verily, if I had commanded anyone to prostrate to other than a law, I would have commanded the women to prostrate before their husbands. This shows us, and what we gain from this hadith, what the ulama, they mentioned, the point of this hadith is that Mu'adh did an action of shirk. An action of major uh, of major kufr. This was a major act of disbelief. But what? One of the uh, the things which prevent takfir is al udr bi jahil is the excuse of ignorance. Mu'adh radiyallahu ta'ala anhu was ignorant to this hukum. He didn't know. It wasn't due to his fault. He didn't know. He thought that this was a way of showing a high regard and love for the Prophet ﷺ, so he prostrated. But the Prophet ﷺ, from his mercy, showed Mu'adh that this was incorrect. And that if that were the case, he would have ordered the, the women to do that for their husbands. But that's not permissible. And it's only this sujood is a type of worship and it is only to Allah so the point of this hadith is show us that Mu'adh now after this hadith the Prophet ﷺ made clear for him the evidence that this is not permissible because the Prophet ﷺ was speaking with why he was speaking with revelation and so he showed Mu'adh that this was not permissible that this was unacceptable. This is haram and this is major kufr. That's why we, knowing this hukum, we cannot prostrate before anything or anyone except Allah Azza wa Jal. So this is evidence of establishing the proof from the sunnah.
And so there are so many evidences in hadith and so many aqwal of the salaf. But we want to stick as concise as we can so we can cover the important points of takfir in order to uh, get into the treaties. From the conditions of takfir al ma'ayin. So remember, we said takfir is two types. Takfir al-mutlaq, which is the general takfir, and takfir al ma'ayin, which is the specific takfir. Meaning you're you're making takfir on a specific individual. You're now saying Zayd is a disbeliever because he did this act of kufr. Uh, So-and-so is a disbeliever. Fatima is a disbeliever because she did this act of kufr. This is what it means, takfir al ma'ayin. You're talking about a specific individual that you're making takfir of because of they're uh, falling into the major shirk or the major uh, major act of kufr. And as another principle that we want to know is that every act of shirk is a type of kufr. But not every kufr, every act of kufr is not shirk. So that's a principle. And we need to know that. Meaning, for example, if you have someone, they belittle the Quran. They step on the Quran knowingly. They say they step on it knowingly. They say, well, you know, it's just, it's the Quran. Whatever. They step on it. This right here is belittling the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is kufr. But this is not shirk. You have not associated a partner with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But they have did an action of disbelief. Moving on to the conditions of takfir al ma'ayin. These are takfir of ma'ayin because takfir mutlaq, the general takfir, is a description of whoever does this is a disbeliever, or whoever is a part of this group is a disbeliever. Meaning the Jews, the Christians, or for example, the the Salaf used to make takfir of the Jehemia, whoever was a fit uh, had the aqidah, the creed of the Jehemia and some of the other sects, some of the sects that they made tikfir of. Certain groups of Shia, Shia Rafida, they make tikfir of them. Not all Shia, no, but the Shia Rafida, those who uh, curse the Sahaba and curse Jibreel alayhi salatu salam and, you know, commit all various types of shirk and believe their imams are infallible. That we, that those are uh, beliefs, uh, those are actions of disbelief. So going on to takfir al-ma'ayin, the specific takfir, there are several uh, conditions. The first condition, and yukun al-ma'ayin baligan aqlan. So the first condition of takfir al-ma'ayin, the specific takfir, is that the the person who is, has done this act of kufr, or this statement of kufr, has uttered the statement of kufr, or has this belief of kufr, they are a mature person possessing intellect. So that means we can't make takfir of a child. We can't make takfir of someone who is uh, necessarily drunk because their aql is, is not with them. Or that they're temporarily insane. Or that they're insane. They do not fit, fit the criterion. So they are excused from takfir. The second category, uh, the second condition of takfir is that the one who uttered a statement of takfir or did an action of takfir or held this belief, well, uh, or did this action of takfir, that they did this بِإِخْتِيَارِهِمْ Meaning they did this by choice. They were not forced to do this. And we're going to get into the details very shortly. The third condition of takfir is that the proof must be established upon the individual. Meaning, as we just mentioned, that you must present evidence to the person before making takfir. Now these are the general conditions for takfir. There are some differences of opinion regarding the ulama of Ahlul Sunnah. 
in the past and present about some details regarding the hujjah, about establishing the proof, and we'll briefly discuss them because we're not here to become, uh, you know, grounded. And we just want an introduction to tekfir because it's relevant that we refrain from it and leave it to ahl al leave it to the people of knowledge. But you need to have some basic grounding because this whole book is really... Uh, discusses those things which nullify a person's Islam and which necessitate tikfir. So we have to have a background, a little little background about tikfir. The fourth condition for tikfir is that the person is not muta'awwalin, meaning that they are not misinterpreting or explaining the way the evidence from their own uh, Misunderstanding, meaning they don't have a, they don't mean to disbelieve, and they are explaining the, for example, the evidence away or whatever the case may be. They are misinterpreting the evidence through misinterpretation. That's also another excuse, another uh, condition for tekfir is that the person is not, uh, does not have this misconception about this, for example about some issue of kufr. The first condition, as we mentioned, which had to do uh, th that a person is mature and they possess intellect. This is the case, and this is in accordance with the hadith of the Prophet wasallam, who said, Rufiya qalam an falatha An naim hatta yastaykath wa an sadir hatta yaqbar wa an al majnoon hatta ya'kul o yufiq أخرجه أحمد. This is a hadith in Ahmed wa Ibn Majah and Al Hakam. This hadith means the Prophet sallallahu said the pin is lifted on three or from three. The person who is sleeping until they awake. The uh, the one who is young who hasn't reached maturity until they become of age of maturity. And the one who is insane or has lost their sanity until they regain their sanity. Or, and this also includes the person who is unconscious until they regain consciousness. So the pen is lifted, meaning they're not held responsible. So this is evidence that these things, that if a person falls under these categories, they are not responsible for the kufr that they may have uh, fallen into. Okay, this is something that prevents making takfir on them. So this is actually one of the uh, one of the things which prevent making takfir of a person is that if they if they fall into this category. The second condition of takfir that we mentioned, which is uh, is that the person. Uh, you know, fell into the issue of tikfir, uh, fell into the issue of kufr by their choice. The proof for that, or this is in reference to that someone has done a statement or a action, a disbelieving action, and that they had that they had a choice in the matter. They were not forced. And why is it restricted to these two? This is a statement or an action because this differs with your belief. No one can force your belief in your heart. No one can force your heart. And that's why the scholars, they mention here, the statement or the action of disbelief. Because, for example, if someone holds a gun to your head and they say, say you're not a Muslim or I'm going to kill you. It's permissible for you to say, I'm not a Muslim, in order to save your life. Islamically, it's permissible. And we'll, we'll get into this evidence right now. Uh, it's permissible for you to do that, but it's impermissible for you to actually hold that in your heart and really believe and say, Khas, you know, I, I disbelieve. No. So this is a matter of the heart. So if on your tongue or you do an action of disbelief in order to save your life then this is permissible 
with a, a, another condition which is mentioned in this ayah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, fi kitabi al-kareem, man kafara billahi min ba'di imanihi illa man ukriha wa qalbuhu mutma'innum bil iman walakin walakin man sharaha bil kufri sadrin فَعَلَيْهِمْ غَدَبٌ مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَلَهُمْ عَذَابٌ عَظِيمٌ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says في كتابه الكريم that whoever disbelieves in Allah and this, this is uh, in, in Surah Al-Nahab and is verse 106 whoever disbelieves in Allah after they had iman after they possessed faith uh, except the one who is forced and his heart is comforted in a man and the one whose heart is open to disbelief they open their heart up to disbelief then it is upon them the wrath or the anger of Allah and a painful torment. So this ayat here shows us that as long as a person has the iman in their heart and if they are forced to utter disbelief or do an action of disbelief, there's still a mu'min. They're still a believer in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because they were forced. And that's why as long as someone is for, being forced is, an, is one excuse to refrain from making takfir on a person. Someone who's forced, you, can, you cannot make takfir of them. They have other the ikra. And ikra, the ulama, they differ about that. We don't need to go into those details. But some of the ulama, they mention that this, that being forced means forced with death. Not just forced that they're going to lose their election seat or forced that they're going to lose a little bit of money or something like this. But generally the ulama define that iqra uh, as the force as being uh, to the level of death, that they're being threat with bodily harm and death. You know, something very serious. Ibn Kathir said about this verse, which is relevant to what we're discussing, اتفق العلماء على أنه يجوز أن يوالي المقرح على كفر إبقالي مهجده ويجوز أن يستقتل كما كان بلال رضي الله تعالى عنه يأبى عليهم وهم يفعلون به الأفاعيل So Ibn Kathir said about this verse he said that the scholars agreed that it is permissible to uh, to outwardly show if someone is forced, uh, an act of kufr, as long as their heart or their soul, their heart uh, remains in iman. And that it is also, he said, well, you Jews, meaning it's also permissible to be punished or killed if, if you choose that route. As Bilal radiallahu ta'ala, he didn't. He could, have, he could have said what the Quraysh wanted him to say when they were punishing him with hot stones on his chest. Radiallahu ta'ala anhu. They were punishing him, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, in the hot desert. And I, today I was in the hot, it was 120 degrees uh, regularly here, right now, because we're in the summer, 120 degrees uh, uh, Fahrenheit, about a little less than 50 degrees. Uh, Celsius. It is very hot. And just, I, I went out when I was going to the masjid and it felt like my garment was on fire because I wore black today. Can you imagine what Bilal radiallahu ta'ala anhu was going through with this hot stone being smashed on his chest? Near death? Thirsty? Burning? Being punished? Tortured? And he still said, Ahad, Ahad. He still said one, one, that it's Allah is one. 
he still bore witness to Tawheed and he could have took the other route and still had Iman and still been rewarded by Allah Azza wa Jal. But he took the most, the more difficult route. Radi Allah ta'ala anhu. Also, other evidence which shows us that uh, there's an excuse for someone who is also, uh, who is, you could say, forced. They, did, they didn't have a choice. So this is a different kind of force. There's the force we meant, the physical force, the uh, threat of force. But then there's also the force of you made a mistake. If you want to call it force. You could say also through khata. This is also an excuse for not making takfir of someone. For example, if I say something to you, I'm giving a speech, and then I make a slip of the tongue. And I correct myself. Or even I don't correct myself, but you correct me later. I say, oh, I, I didn't realize what I said. Because I was unaware that I, I made this mistake. And what is evidence for that? The evidence for that is the hadith where the Prophet ﷺ mentioned the man who lost his riding beast in the desert. And then his riding beast came back to him. Maybe it was a camel, whatever, probably more than likely a camel in the hot desert with uh, his provisions on it. And he was so happy that he said, from, from his happiness, he said, Allahumma anta abdi wa ana rabbuk. Akhtam in tafar. He made a mistake from his excessive happiness. He was so happy he didn't realize that he said that you are my servant and I am your Lord. What he meant to say is I am your servant and you are my Lord to show that humility to Allah. But he was tired. He was in the hot desert and he made a mistake with his tongue. This shows us that this is one of the things which prohibit from making takfir. The Prophet ﷺ said this man akhta, but he didn't mention that this man was punished or that he was uh, held accountable for that. Because the Prophet ﷺ said in another hadith that his ummah is uh, uh, excused from that. And so the ulama, they mention that uh, uh, this, this factor here. Also, another evidence to show that there are excuses for when a person falls in to an act of kufr, that there, there's excuses, uh, is a statement of Ibn Hazm. He mentions, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, he said, Wala khilaf an imra'a an imra'an an imriyan Lo aslama wa lam ya'lam shara' al-islam fa'taqada anna al-khamr halal wa anna laysa 'ala al-insan salat wa huwa lam yablaghu wa lam wa huwa lam yablaghu hukm Allah ta'ala lam yakun kafiran bila khilaf ya'tad bi hatta idha qamat 'alayya al-hujja fatamadihi na'idan be ijmal umma fuwa kafir. Very important statement. So Ibn Hazm, this is also one of the things. So this shows us that ignorance is an excuse, even with regards to fundamental issues in the religion. And there's details with this for preventing takfir. So Ibn Hazm said, there is no difference of opinion with the scholars that if someone becomes a Muslim, a new Muslim, and they don't know the rulings of Islam, and they believe that, for example, alcohol is lawful, and they believe that prayer is not an obligation, and the ruling of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not been presented to him, then this person is not a disbeliever. The, the scholars have ijma'a on this. He said, Bila khilaf bi," Without any difference of opinion, except, of course, probably some shad like the Khawarij. He said, until the proof has been established to them, meaning they've been taught, they have to learn. They have to be learned, the hujah has to be established, and then if they reject the, the consensus of the, the, the ummah after this, then they are a disbeliever, meaning they've been the 
It's been proven to them. They understand this proof, this hujjah, and so on and so forth. And there are so many other uh, evidences. And Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, he says, and this shows us also about those things which prevent making takfir. He said, مَنْ كَانَ مُؤْمِنٍ بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ مُطْلَقٍ وَلَمْ يَبْلَغْهُ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ مَا يُبَيْنْ لَهُ سُوَابِ فَإِنَّهُ لَا يَحْكُمْ بِكُفْرِهِ حَتَّى تُقُومْ عَلَيَّ الْحُجَّةِ الَّتِي مِنْ خَالِفَهَا كَفَرْ إِذْ كَثِيرٌ مِنَ النَّاسِ يُخْتِي فِي مَا يَتَأَوَّلُهُ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ وَيَجْهَلُ كَثِيرٌ مِنْ مَا يَرْدُ مِنْ مَعَانِي الْكِتَابِ وَالسُّنَّةِ وَخَطَأْ وَالنِّسْيَانِ مَرْفُوعَانِ عن هذه الأمة وكفر لا يكون إلا بعد البيان. شيخ الإسلام ابن تيمية said, whoever is a believer in Allah and His Messenger, in general, مطلقا. And they did not have knowledge. They did not receive knowledge, and th and the truth was not clarified to them. Then. They are not judged with disbelief until the proof is established upon them and then they differ with that proof. Then they have disbelieved. And he said, for verily many of the people make mistakes in what they make, uh, they misinterpret uh, from the Quran. And there's, there's a lot of ulama of Ahl Sunnah or there's many ulama of Ahl Hadith and some of the scholars even of Fiqh and others that are known to be imams of the sunnah but they made mistakes some mistakes that the Ashari have uh, like Imam Anawi, Imam Ibn Hazm himself uh, Imam uh, Ibn Hajar Askalani they made ta'wil of the sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but they, had, they were known for the sunnah and they had the excuse of ta'wil and they were not known for being people of desires but instead you would say that these were mistakes that they made and they died upon those mistakes, those great imams, we don't follow in them in those mistakes. The point being is no one from Ahl al-Sunnati with Jama'ah makes takfir of those great imams of the Sunnah for their mistakes in ta'wil of the Qur'an and misconstruing uh, ayat, uh, the sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he said, يَجْهَلْ كَثِيرٌ مِمَّا يَرَدْ مِنْ مَعَانِي الْكِتَابِ وَالسُنَّةِ There's also many people who are ignorant for, uh, and they, they reject many of the meanings from the Quran and the Sunnah. And, they, they, and, and then he says, but mistakes and forgetfulness are two things which this Ummah are uh, excused by. And so, kufr, the judgment of kufr, does not apply to them until after it has been made clear to them. So I hope this is clear, and there's so much to say about this, but we don't want to prolong this uh, issue too much. One last thing I want to say with regards to this is that uh, regarding uh, the hujjah, establishing the proof, there are two different statements from the ulama of Ahl Sunnah regarding this. The first statement is that the hujjah, that when you establish the proof to an individual before, uh, to, to make him, is that there's a condition, it's conditional that they understand it. So for example, you can't start speaking to someone in Arabic, giving them verses of the Quran, and they're not Arab and they don't understand Arabic, and say I've established the proof on them now and they're still doing this action, they're a disbeliever. No. So a group of the ulama, uh, many of the ulama, say that they must understand this uh, proof. They must understand this proof. And that is the most logical, uh, it makes logic, because if you just establish the hujjah, and it is not, I mean, you just read, give people evidence, and they don't understand the evidence, you don't, uh, it doesn't seem to go with the rest of the evidence that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he doesn't punish until he sends a messenger. Is this messenger only giving in a language that people don't understand? Or is the messenger giving it and making bayina? All, all the evidence shows that they made it clear. So the scholars that hold this view that it must be made clear to the individual, they must understand, is many of the ulama. Many of the ulama hold this view, 
and from them is Ibn Arabi, not the Ibn Arabi, the Sufi that's uh, that had uh, lots of kufr in his belief, but this is another uh, uh, Imam, Ibn Arabi, from Ahl Sunnah, and Ibn Qudama, who is the uh, author of Al-Mughni and Fiqh al uh, Umdat al Fiqh and other books, great Imam, and books in Aqidah, which are known. Also, Shaykh al Islam ibn Taymiyyah had this view, Ibn al Qayyim had this view, and some of the Imams, uh, the grandsons of uh, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, as it is mentioned. And there's some difference regarding that. The second view with regards to establishing the pr proof is that the Hujjah is established by just telling the people, and it is not conditional for them to understand it. Some of those scholars that hold this view is some of the imams, they call them the uh, imam uh, da'wah, meaning they are the, like the grandsons, Muhammad ibn al Wahhab is considered uh, one of the imams or the imam of da'wah, and those who came after him in this Arab Peninsula uh, are considered the imam da'wah, this is what they refer to them. So all the way up to probably the time of Bin Baz, or perhaps you still might say uh, Fozan and these imams are uh, Imam Tadawa, but usually this term uh, Imam Tadawa refers to Muhammad ibn Wahhab and his grandsons and so forth, those up to probably the time of about Bin Baz uh, and so forth and their Fatawa. So the uh, Imam Tadawa, they, uh, many of them, this is associated with them and it's also a statement uh, associated with Muhammad ibn Wahhab and there's differences of opinion with regards to that that they hold this opinion that it's sufficient just to make balug, that you just have to say say the evidence, even if the person doesn't understand it. But I believe firmly that the first opinion that Sheikh al-Islam and many of the ulama hold is, is by far more correct and even intellectually more sound, and not that we discard our intellect, nor do we take our intellect over the nusus, but this also seems more in accordance with the evidence of the Quran and Sunnah as well. Because how if I speak to some Japanese people that do not speak even English, maybe, or if they speak English, but I speak to them in Arabic, and, I, and then I say, and he's a Japanese Muslim, or Chinese Muslims, or wherever, and they don't understand the language I'm speaking to them in. And I say, Khalas, I gave you the evidence. Why are you still doing the shirk? and then I make takfir of them. No, instead this is one of the prohibitors to takfir and that you must, one of the things that is a condition of takfir is that you establish the proof upon the individual. And the last points I want to mention with regards to takfir is some, some general principles. One of the principles is يُحْرُمُ تَكْفِيرُ الْمُسْلَمْ بِغَيْرِ حَقُ وَذُرِيَّةٌ that it is impermissible to make takfir of a Muslim uh, for other than the truth, meaning meeting those conditions of takfir and so forth, and that it is a means to killing and spilling blood without the right to do so. So it's very important for us to understand this, and that's why we're going through, this is the whole purpose we're mentioning takfir, is so that we do not fall into, don't take this book and what we learn from this book and run and just go around applying takfir, nor should we be engaging in long and debates at all about takfir. And this is un unfortunately one of the great fitness that we we deal with things uh, talking about hukum bi ghayr ma anzal Allah, talking about ruling by other than Allah, what Allah revealed, because there are groups and sects and individuals and ideologues in the West, especially in the UK and in Europe, more than America. America, we have this fitna, but not like we have in Europe for various reasons. And we have many, we've had many takfiri uh, ideologues, Abu Qatada, Abu Hamza, Misri, uh, Abu Muhammad Maqdisi, I don't think he was in the UK, but uh, uh, Abdullah al-Faisal, uh, the Muhajirun, Umar, Umar, uh, Umar al-Bakri, all these uh, takfiri groups, Ahl al-Bid'a wa dalal 
and they helped to spread and fuel the fire of Tikfir, light the fire of Tikfir and Shubahat around the people and spread this ideology of making takfir without the right to do so, without the conditions, and busying the people, not busying with teaching Salat, teaching Zakat, teaching Hajj, teaching the, the Usul Iman and the Usul al Deen, but instead teaching about major Messiah like takfir, and instead you should go to bed not worrying about how, when to pray Fajr, and how to make Qiyam al -Layl, and what time to make Qiyam al -Layl, and getting up for Qiyam al -Layl. but instead you should go to bed wor wor wondering about whether so-and-so leader is a believer or not. This is what they busy the people with. And I know countless brothers who've been locked up, who've been tortured, who've been, who got into that fitna, and fell into Dalal Mubin, because they didn't listen when we tried to establish the proof to them that it's about Kitab Allah Sunnah the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Faham and the Salaf of this Ummah and that these are issues way above their manzil. They don't know, they, none of those guys, I, I know so many brothers, they didn't know Arabic, they didn't study anywhere, they just were big tekfiris. And they got involved in things which destroyed their lives, their families, and their livelihoods. Wallahu Mista'an. قال ابن القيم رحمه الله تعالى فمن القبائر تكفير من لم يكفر هو الله ورسول صلى الله عليه وسلم ابن القيم said from the major sins is making تكفير of someone who Allah and his messenger don't make تكفير of صلى الله عليه وسلم meaning not going about those, those things the ulama have consensus of and looking at the kalam of the ulama, the salaf of salih, ridwan Allah alayhim, and that from the book and the sunnah, and being a person of knowledge who can do that, not just you reading some statements translated for you, and then getting into issues about other bijahil, and getting into this about, uh, this one is mukra and this one's not mukra. I saw king so-and-so wearing a cross, I saw this one doing this, I saw this, uh, this one praising this, leader and this one was they, they allowed a base on their territory and all these issues <coughs> way above the muzzle of the people and they got involved in this distortion and they went astray and they they are misguided and they misguided others another important issue I want to mention and there's so much kalam of the ulama and we just don't have time and this is not our study another important principle we want to mention yajibu tathabbut min khabari wuku al ma'ayin fi kufri this is also see these are more background things I, I don't want you to necessarily I just want you to have this in your head these aren't things to necessarily write down because these are more intricate issues but uh, about takfir and at the end of the, our study, we'll just briefly go back over the conditions of takfir and what prevents takfir just briefly. And you'll have a much better idea after studying this whole uh, series. But this, these are important principles too, which are related to this issue of takfir. So it's an obligation to affirm what you hear about a specific individual falling into disbelief. Meaning that you cannot go and just make takfir to someone based on hearsay. You need to make tathabbut. These issues, by the way, these apply to also tibdir. They apply to tibdir. That you cannot just make tibdir and call people innovators just because everybody else, because your friend said so. Because your friend said it so and they didn't even make tathabbut. So this is why it's very important in Islam to affirm what you hear. Not just running around making tikleer and blabbering your mouth around and causing fitna around the ummah. And we already know the hadith. I mentioned it countless times. And I'm going to mention it really quickly. The Prophet ﷺ said about those people who will be punished in the graves. He said, He said, Verily they're being punished in the graves. He's talking about two Jews that were being punished in the grave. And they're not being punished for something which they think that the people think is great. It's a big sin. And he said, as for one of them, is they used to not clean themselves properly when they used the bathroom at Karamuk Malah. And as for the other one, Bakana Yimshi bin Namima, is they used to go around spreading tales with the intention to spread falsehood and wickedness in the community. This applies to this issue of takfir and applies to the issue of tibdir. Some people, they go and tafsik. So this applies to spreading wickedness in the community uh, whether it's tikfir, whether you want to say so and so is a kafir, I heard they're a kafir. You know they did this. They ruled by other than what Allah Subhanahu wa Taala revealed. They 
uh, you know, they, they don't agree on this particular point. They didn't make bay'ah to ISIS and Al-Qaeda. They didn't do... And then you make takfir of them. Or so-and-so is a mubtadi'ah because of this. Because he doesn't agree with me that Sheikh Ibrahim Rahali is this. And he doesn't agree with me that Abu Khadija said this. And he doesn't agree that Sheikh Rabi said this. And he doesn't agree that Sheikh uh, Suleiman Rahali said this. And Sheikh uh, Fozan said this. And Bin Baz had this on this mas'ala. And so he doesn't agree with me. So he's a mubtadi'ah. Wa'iyadun billah. We've got to be careful about this. And then you spread it around the community. In order to spread fitna, then you are mustahik. This person who does this is rightfully earning the punishment of the grave. May Billah bin Dharaka. Why? Because they're doing a major sin by spreading wickedness in the community. So, anyhow, going back to the mas'ala, Shaykh Muhammad ibn Adawahab ta'ala said about this issue. He said, La nukafru men la na'rafu. من هو القفر بسبب ناقد ذكر عنه ونحن لم نتحققه. He said, we do not. This is Muhammad ibn Dhuhab, who all those uh, people of desires and mubtadi'een, especially Ahl al-Tasawwuf, the Sufis, they refute him and say the Wahhabi, the Wahhabi, Wahhabi, they made takfir and they killed the Muslims. وَعِيَادٌ بِاللَّهِ They clear. Here's what he said out of his own mouth in his books. Even before they wrote this about him, he refuted what they would have to say after them. After him, he said, "We do not make takfir on someone who we don't know anything about, uh, and, and uh, about their whether they fell into kufr, just because uh, something was mentioned to us about they, that they fell into kufr. We instead." We don't make takfir un unless we have no haqq, that we have uh, affirmed that, that, that that's true. That they find out for sure. They establish the proof. They establish the proof and ask and, 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 and research that issue and make clear for those individuals. So that shows us that that's impermissible to just go make takfir as if you are insane. Another uh, qaida I want to mention And this somewhat relates to the other issue, but this actually has to do with actually the action itself. Is it really an action of disbelief? So this is very important. Yajibu to thabbitu men anna ma sadra min hadha al-ma'ayyin annahu min al-kufri al-bayyin indul ulama. It's very important that we affirm that the action that someone is trying to make takfir of someone else over that it's actually an action of kufr. And I'll give you an example to make this clear for us. I, I was reading, because part of my research, I'm doing my PhD right now, and it has to do with ISIS and those groups, okay? And it has to do with the Salafis' role in refuting these people. And so I've had to read, and I've looked at their videos, some of their videos, and I've read some of their sources. One of the things they do, very commonly, and this is what Al-Qaeda, and this is what the original Khawarij did as well, is they make takfir of those people who disagree with them, best, and then they kill them, they make their blood lawful, because they are in a battle situation, they just kill, they're fighting, and they're in Syria, and, and Iraq, and all over, so for them, if you do not agree with them, and make bay'ah to their fake khalifa, then that means you're a disbeliever automatically. So here they've made a new condition for takfir which did not exist before them. Because here they have a false person that is not accepted by the Ummah of Muhammad as a Khalifa and they've made this jama'ah and this leader, their leader, and they've made al-wala' wal bara based upon this leader. That if you reject him, you're a disbeliever. If you accept him, you're a believer. And you make hijrah to them. Wa'iyadun billah. So this shows us that this is not something which the ulama make takfir about. There's no consensus about what these people are upon. There's no, uh, they have no hijjah. But yet they make takfir for this. So this is a, an illustration that you can't just make takfir because people are not with you. This is a qaida which was before George Bush, but he said you're either for us or against us. You're either with us or against us. And prior to him, this was a part of many ideologies that held this same ideology. You're either with us or against us. <coughs> and it's a dangerous ideology, and especially when it leads to takfir. 
A last point I want to make with regards to takfir is takfir ma'ayyan inna ma yukum bihi ahl al-ilm wa la yujuz in yatasadda lahu al-awam o insaf al-muta'allameen So it's very important that takfir uh, takfir al-ma'ayyan when you talk about a specific individual that this is the job really for the Islamic judges if you're in an Islamic society and if you are not this is for the ulama this is for the scholars and those people who are well grounded in these issues so it's not for anyone and everyone teachers it's not for teachers and it's not for beginning students of knowledge and even generally in for students of knowledge unless they're well grounded and well grounded in this issue so it's very important and there's still so much I want to say about other bijahil and stuff like this but we don't want to get too deep into many issues and we've went way over the time and I hope this is clear and the way that we're going to do this uh, <clears throat> so our next sitting will actually be uh, beginning the treaties and the in the law may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant, grant us tawfiq and ikhlas with thabat and if there are questions the preferred method I prefer is that they are related to our topics we're studying <clears throat> and number two you send it by email and I will try my best to get to it and if it's something above my head, then I will go to one of the scholars and, and translate the, the answer so that way we have it. And I'll try to answer those questions at the beginning of the next Dars, if there's the next lecture, lecture that we do, or, uh, or at the end of the Dars. We'll, we'll see how we can manage that. And we ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil. Anything I said that was correct, was from Allah anything I said that was incorrect, was for myself and the shaitan, wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, ala nabiyyina Muhammad, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.